afternoon and welcome to March 24th, the Special Committee Police and Community Meeting. I'm Councilwoman Ortiz, bear with me. I just got out of one meeting and trying to get ready for this meeting. Okay, um, I'm Councilwoman Ortiz. I represent District 3. Uh, my other colleagues can um, introduce themselves. Um, uh, Mayor Padilla. Okay. Chief Brian Wheelis. Chief Brian Wheelis. Okay. All right. And um, let's see if we can go over the minutes. Do you want to? But we'll put that to side. To the side. I know Karen was on that same meeting, so they should be finishing up. Um, let's go ahead and go with um, number three, the Mosaic Partnership and TPD. And we have Jennifer Cross. Jennifer, if you want to sit down, you're welcome to sit down at one of the mics All as right. opposed to the podium. But if you want to stand at the podium, you, you're welcome to. I have a hard time with the microphone anyway. You know that. <laughs> <clears throat> Rather loud. All right. Uh, so... I participated in the first round of the Mosaic Partnership as a paired partner, mm -hmm. and there were some challenges that had to be navigated with regard to um, hybrid Zoom. I think it lost some effectiveness and some translation, but there were enough pieces that were uh, very solid that I think we're trying to implement from a training standpoint as we move forward in, at TPD. Um, oh, there's Karen Hiller. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to touch on a couple of different things from the uh, Mosaic Partnership website that talks about the intent um, of those partnerships and perception of another person being a good team member or community member occurs when there's a depth of understanding of who the person truly is. Uh, a change, positive results that can occur in the community, a change in people's unconscious judgments of others based on culture and difference. And I think um, how this is relevant is that annually we do bias-based policing and fair and impartial policing training. And historically, when you have officers go to that, it feels like sometimes it becomes um, stale. It's the same information over and over. We talk about implicit bias and explicit bias and what those look like. Um, but I think we fail sometimes to be able to recognize what our implicit biases are within ourselves. And I think that's what I walked away with from this partnership um, was that the pairings and the interpersonal relationships that resulted were an easy way to highlight um, our similarities rather than our differences by kind of attacking that. And my own personal experience was that I was paired with an educator um, who was actually English as it was her second language, not her first. Um, and we were so similar and our backgrounds were so different. And I, when the first time that we met through that, I remember thinking, okay, this will be interesting because as an educator, often our ideas don't align with regard to where police belong within the education system and what they can bring to the table. And it was, it was interesting to highlight what I believed because of her profession. Um, and I think so frequently when we do bias-based policing, or fair and impartial policing, we focus on bias as it relates to race uh, because that's what people see. And so people are more hesitant to acknowledge their bias because they see it as admitting racism or um, racial profiling are the two key terms. When in reality, I think that the process of this Mosaic Partnership can help us acknowledge and understand what our biases are and be more inclined to see them as positive ways to address them rather than that negative connotation. And so we're looking to implement that. Um, I actually went to a meeting last night with a couple of partners in the community um, regarding how, how we might implement that and what it might look like because the partnership, the Mosaic pairs, isn't really gonna be effective for us within the police academy, right? Because it's, it's all of our recruit officers and our time is spent on training. But there are some pieces we intend to pull over um, not just acknowledging explicit and implicit bias, but being able to identify what our own are that we might not be aware of. And so, and then I have signed up to coach this next round. Uh, could be really good, could be a disaster, we'll see. <laughs> Probably a disaster with you. <laughs> be over the top, I'll just mm. say that, Karen. If you ask her for 100, <laughs> she's gonna give you 110. 
That's true. So who are the private partners that you met with? Um, last night included a young lady by the name of Tara James Wallace, mm -hmm. um, Parkus Master Clark. Uh, Tara and I actually sort of hooked up in kind of an early organic mosaic partnership um, back in June of 2020 when the city was experiencing a lot of unrest and a lot of things related to the George Floyd incident in, in Minnesota. Um, she wrote a letter to the newspaper um, and it was basically about the downtown um, march that then Chief Cochran participated in and then how that went sideways and how the, there was a media misrepresentation of that event mm -hmm. um, and how off-putting that was to her and that she wanted the credit to the young women who, who organized that, that event to be separated from the negative turn it took. Mm -hmm. And I read that and I reached out to her. I'd never met her before, didn't know who she was, but I reached yeah. out to her and I said, um, I don't know that we have a lot of the same opinions on things, but I do know that we both agree that there's sometimes media representation. And I think that's a really good place for you and I to sit down and have some difficult conversations about some things. And we met in a coffee shop and we were there for two hours. Awesome. Um, and through that, that partnership has grown. Um, there was Sergeant Harmon from the Sheriff's Office was there and he's going to participate. And then, like I said, part, Pastor Marcus Clark um, from the Love Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. And I think that our concept that we're working towards that we hope to roll out, um, surprise chief, that we hope to roll out <laughs> to um, the top, uh, the city manager, the mayor, the police chief, the fire chief, kind of the top echelon. Um, is a concept of human library books where we ask individuals to come to the table and give us a chapter from their book with no other context. Um, and then we ask the participants in the room to help us write that story. And I think that uncovers, um, you know, you can write an entire book by reading one chapter of that book, but what happens when you're wrong? Um, and so I think it will be very telling and very um, introspective to see that sometimes we may not be aware of what our biases are, but they do exist. And we've got some people that we've um, engaged. We're hoping that those library books will look very different, you know, domestic violence victims. And sometimes we write what we think the past of a domestic violence victim is. Um, recovered addicts, um, those that are unsheltered population, um, parolees. And so we're looking for that concept to um, move forward probably this summer. And a lot of that stemmed from some of the, the tenets of the Mosaic Partnership and what that brought to me personally. Well, and the motto of this um, committee has been looking through the lens of the other person. You know, um, I've, I've had discussions with um, Sheriff Harmon on different things, um, on different views, you know. Um, and but you have to be able to sit down and listen, and you have to be able to sit down and try to understand that person. You know, um, I remember one time I was conversating with him and, and um, we were talking and, and I said, you know, my grandparents taught us not to ever, not to see color, you know, that's just to see the person for who they are. And so um, he came back, his, his reply back to me was, I want you to see color. And so that was very different for me because that, that was not something that I was always taught. And that's something that even I taught my kids and their kids, don't, you know, you, you see people for who, you are, who they are, not, not to be prejudiced. But he said, but I need you to see that I'm this black man. I need you to see that I'm, I, you, you need to see color when it pertains to different things. And so, that was a that was a very interesting reply back to me, and and one that I've never ever forgot, you know, um, because that's how people see him, even though I might not see him like that. That's how people to see him, and he says that's why I even tell my um, coworkers or my colleagues, I need you to see color. I need you to recognize me. Right. So, and I I think that that's the direction we're headed. Mm -hmm. um, less focused on diversity as far as if we were to if we were to take a picture of the room um what does that picture look like mm -hmm. and more focused on being able to have diverse thought processes and accept diverse perspectives and be open to that because we can have a room that looks very different mm -hmm. but if there's a group think going on within that room we haven't really checked that diversity box and we haven't really met what we're trying to meet and so i think that's the challenge we're trying to ignite within within the police department 
Um, and we hope to take it even beyond that. Uh, you know, that, that bias presents itself. A lot of people see that in policing or, or place that on policing because we're the most encountered part of government. We're the most encountered part of the social system for a lot of people. Um, and the reality of it is it's not relegated to police work. And if we, even if we were to fix all bias in police work, I was at a training yesterday and they said there was actually a study done, a university study that um, a, a particular bias that they measured was actually less prevalent in police uh, because they're taught to look at different things. And I think we have to stop seeing bias as a negative and saying I'm not biased and instead embrace I am biased and how do I counterbalance the bias that I have, right? Um, and overcome it instead of I don't have it because we all have it, every single one of us. Exactly. It, we just don't know how to recognize it and acknowledge it. And so that's what we're working towards. So, and the reason why I was told that you wanted that, sh that when you did that, you wanted to share with us some of the, how you were going to implement that in your training. Is that correct, Karen? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and so as, I, that's kind of what I wanted to hear. Yeah, too, and, and that's where we're looking at is, is this human library concept, this um, bringing to the forefront um, these stories and these these things that cause people not only to understand the definition of biases, but how it manifests in themselves and how they can recognize it, acknowledge it, and overcome it rather than deny it because they think if they acknowledge bias, they're saying they're racially profiling it or that they're racist. And so that's the direction we're headed. That's how we're trying to implement some of that from a training perspective is to bring some of those pieces and some of those, you know, the, the mosaic partnership is built on interdependent relationships and learning to get past what you see as someone from the get-go and know who they are as a person because then you can have some of those in-depth conversations. Um, and more often than not, we're, we're too uncomfortable to have the difficult conversations because we haven't built those personal relationships. And so that's what we're working to do, um, not only within, within our recruit officer class, but in our in-services. Okay. And, and I had suggested that because the issue going all the way back to two years ago when we started this group, one of the issues that kept coming up was training. Mm -hmm. You know, what kind of training is occurring? Do we need to change that? And because she had that aha experience, if you will, and had, had shared with me that it had made a lot of difference and that um, she was looking at some, some really substantial changes in approach, particularly regarding race relations. I thought it would be timely to, to share it with this group. Mm -hmm. As we're, if I understand correctly, where you are going, Chair, at this point, trying to wrap it up and say, okay, we all know that Time has passed since we began this initiative. And so in, in looking at, OK, if we have a list of things that people thought needed fixed, we needed to decide whether there was really a problem or not, obviously, with each of those. And then if there had been issues or even good, strong questions, had there been things that occurred since that time till now that either already were underway or were seriously planned that we thought would adequately address that issue. So again, I felt it was very timely to bring forward this information since she is running the training division. We have had a lot of changes in training very, very quickly in the last six months, some of them exceptionally large. Um, and most of them related to not only saying that, yes, we train on this, but being able to very expeditiously pull up what specifically we trained, what, what is here. Um, and Chief Wheelis was instrumental in helping me push that through. It was a rather large undertaking that has <laughs> consumed my world for the last four months, but I'm unbelievably excited about that capability um, where not only, you know, when, when we used to say, well, how many hours did we have in this or how many hours did we have in that? Not only can we tell you now moving forward, we had this many hours, but here's what the content was. Here's exactly what we trained our officers in, and here's how that interaction was received. Um, and I'm really, really excited about that. Awesome. Awesome. If I may, Chair. Yes, you may. Uh, I like what I'm hearing. Um, I can't 
We remember how many racial profiling and bias-based policing trainings I've been through. Um, you make a point, though. Oftentimes, um, we start off, I think, in that training, and usually that's given by an outside entity rather than internally, with the assumption that we're talking about uh, race and ethnicity primarily. Um, I'll go back uh, a few years when uh, then Mayor Wagner and myself and others uh, were trained by a group out of Kansas City. Uh, and that was more cultural awareness is what it was called back then. And we had a, two or three teams within the city that would present, and we presented to the entire work uh, employees of the city of Topeka. That was one of the toughest things uh, <laughs> in an assignment that I've ever done because there were some very receptive people to the conversations and others, uh, I'll be honest with you, a couple I threw out of the class yep. because they just were so disruptive and so set in their mind that they were not letting others learn. So there, it, it is a challenge. Mm -hmm. But your comments point out the need, in my opinion, uh, to consider that, uh, like you said, we all have our biases, mm -hmm. and you may call them preferences. It all depends what they are. So I'm bi I'm biased toward cherry pie. <laughs> I like that. I mean, we all yeah. they can be as minimal as that, yeah. or they could be the kind of news media you listen to. So, and we all have those differences. You could. We used to say that in those in that training here, five white males and five white females, and we assumed that they all have the same kind of uh, life experiences because of their race, mm -hmm. and that's way out of bounds. Um, and you start asking the questions that uh, dive into how you learned from your family, how you learned during your school years, the kind of, of influences that you listen to, even to music, what you read. Uh, all those things change our perceptions uh, about life and others. Um, and I like to say, and I hope, that people change and grow as they get older, but sometimes that's not the case. I think it's important to uh, create an environment both in the schools uh, and it, as in employers where people reinforce that those ideas of the value of having you know diversity again that's one of the words you use it and immediately people's minds go to black white green and yellow and that's that's not enough but that they value the experiences uh, of others uh, in so many ways. And so for me, that's a, a, a tough challenge to how you integrate it into, uh, let's say, law enforcement or the fire department or a bank. You know, a guy walks in right off, bat, right off the bat. Uh, a loan officer might take a quick look and say, well, I'm wasting my time with this guy. When he hasn't yet had the opportunity to learn about that person and what they're trying to accomplish, what their background is, all those things. So in order to keep that at the forefront of everything that we do, I'm open to some ideas or suggestions of how that's integrated, not just in the training form, but how does that happen day to day? How does that, when officers, um, get their, I guess, marching orders from their supervisors, like yourself and the chief, sergeants, you know. Uh, I know they used to do that, what, roll call training? I don't know if they st you still do that sure. or not. How that, how that is uh, an expected part of your day, daily learning and remembering of not just who you are, but who you are serving. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's where Oftentimes the conflict comes in before 
anything's ever said even, that I've already done a mental assessment of you, and it may be and it's usually pretty inaccurate uh, because you can't do that without knowing the person. So for me, I'm really interested in how uh, the chief and you have collaborated to put together a training uh, environment that goes beyond the in-service training, goes beyond the training room, how it goes into, like I was able to sit in staff meetings the other day and I appreciated that. How, how does it go into the staff meeting? You know, how does it go into that and reinforced on a regular basis? I think that's a challenge, uh, sure. but To encourage you to continue to find that way, I think, is what we're tr I'm trying to find mm -hmm. for the city of Topeka, not just with the police department, you know, within our planning division, our public works, how we interact with people, period, as a service provider, how that is ingrained into how we think. So if you don't mind if I respond Please. a little bit. Oh. So I think the biggest thing is that we have to reverse that training process, right? My experience in almost 20 years in law enforcement is that the experience on bias and on how we interact with the community is often a PowerPoint up on a screen that says this is what bias looks like, right? Mm -hmm. And it's very mm -hmm. easy to sit in the chair and go, but I don't do that, I don't, yeah. I'm not, I don't do that, right? I can easily sit there and say that I don't stop someone based on the color of their skin. I don't interact with someone based on the color of their skin. I make my judgments based on these other things. And when we pigeonhole what we believe bias looks like and what we're trying to avoid, mm -hmm. um, it's very easy to be the, I'm not that guy, right? It's very easy to sit there and go, I don't meet those check boxes. I don't do that. My goal is to flip the training and identify what your bias does look like be it ever what it may. And so instead of giving you what the label of what I think bias is, um, it's as simple as giving that chapter, saying, here's the chapter, tell me how the story ends. And then we give the real ending and you get to sit back and go, okay, that's what that looks like, right? And so by reading one chapter in someone's book, you've written their whole story. But if you actually get to the end of their story and it's different, then there's an introspection there that goes, that, that wasn't what I expected. I didn't expect bias to look like that. Um, and so it's, I think the way you do that is by forcing people to look inward instead of identify bias that's outward. You're asking them to say, okay, what is my bias and how, how can I, uh, my example is myself. I, I went to a meeting the other day and I said, I, I was, I've grown up in Topeka my whole life. I've been here, um, graduated from a local high school. And I said, you tell me which one. And I say that multiple times. And the answer is always the same. Washburn roll. Nope. And we go all the way down the list. Well, you were out there with that guy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, that guy? That, you know who I'm talking so about. So my point being is that it runs the gamut, and it uh -huh. always goes in the same order. It's always Washburn roll, Seaman, Shawnee Heights, Topeka West, Topeka High. I graduated from Highland Park. Mm -hmm. And I, my counter back to that is what is it about me that, that – put it as Washburn rule. Is it the way I speak? Is it the way I look? Is it any of those things? Um, it's very small, but it's consistent. Mm -hmm. And it's consistent in every aspect of this community. Mm -hmm. That is an introspective thing to make. And the people in the room, when I said it, raised their eyebrows. And I could tell that there was a moment of recognition that had I just put up there these check boxes of what bias looks like, but then in that moment, ears were opened. Hearts were opened because it's like, okay, maybe I do need to hear what's going to be said. And so that's my goal, is to turn the focus inward to the individual. And you're right. You know as well as I do you're going to have, but that's why you have to have your, your books. I told these books that are going to be part of our human library to tell their story, read their chapter. You have to be a hardback book. You can't be in here as a paperback, mm -hmm. right? All right. Um, and that needs to be real. And, and you have to have enough space from the chapter you think people would judge you on that you can withstand that. And if you're not ready, that's okay. And we won't use your story. Um, so that's where we're working on is building that library and giving the opportunity for people to, to write the story and see how you write an ending based on one person's chapter and how you need to reevaluate that. I'm going to give you my chapter. I'm, I'm open to it. I'm going to give that, it to that's you. That's interesting. And how did you come to yeah, this? That is interesting. This way of doing it. 
quite frankly, this, these were just some personal conversations about exactly the same thing you just asked. How do we get away from the standard, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, where everybody goes, well, I don't do that, I'm good to go, and get people to engage in difficult conversations. A, a bias-based policing class shouldn't be a checkbox at the end of the day. You should leave it having felt some discomfort. And if you didn't feel any discomfort, then you haven't experienced any change. And so we want to make people uncomfortable. And I know that that's not going to be a popular opinion, but um, popularity has never really been my goal. <laughs> uh, <coughs> you, you mentioned something, that, and I know that the bias-based policing or racial profiling, whichever, is a mandatory uh, training state law. for the state law. But the last time I was involved directly with the police department and, and others presenting that, uh, they started off with a, kind of a canned presentation that was yes. given from KLETC. Uh, but quickly, that became out of date, and then it became, like you said, just a checkbox. I have to go to hazmat training. Everybody roll your eyes, you know, uh, or whatever it was. And, and, you know, I have to go in. I have to put in my, my time. I'm checked off. I'm good for it. But it really wasn't, in my opinion, substantial information. I don't, I don't think it was changing minds. I don't think it was opening minds. And so that's why I ask how you came to that. And now, Chief and, and, and Jennifer, I guess you ha as long as you have that on your agenda, mm -hmm. your training agenda, how you create it and how you present it, you have much more leeway now is my question. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. As long as you cover what's spelled out in the law, you're good to go. And part of it is going over our policies, which, which we do. Mm -hmm. um, the training platform we, we purchased allows for us to do that and for it to be documented, tracked. Um, but yes, there is, there is more leeway. Uh, sort of this new curriculum for the basic academy, we have to meet certain learning objectives and we have to meet certain points, but we can do it how we see fit. And, and I think we do an exceptional job at that in Topeka mm -hmm. and we're just getting better by the day. So. It's always a point to, for you and for the community to understand that KLETC is the minimum standard, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we haven't been at the minimum standards for, for a long time. So we have, and as you can see, we have the, the people who are progressive thinkers and are challenging and having the conversations and moving the needle. So I would reiterate that I'm, I'm very excited about where our training is going, but I'm also very proud that the, the police department is taking on a, a lead role in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not something that we shy away from. Yeah, I would say that the department has have has exceeded the minimum standard for decades, right. and, and and I'm really glad to hear about this new approach. It is flip flopping it, uh, and like you said, it might be a little more un uncomfortable for folks. But I'm interested to see how it turns out. Uh, be invited very soon. Uh, I'd be a fly on the wall in one of the training <laughs> sessions. I'd like to see how it's received. Mm -hmm. And then my question goes to the new people get this. Do the current, is yeah. that going to be part of uh, the 40 hours uh, a year for, for the people who are already in the job, been doing it 5, Both. 10, 20 years? Because, uh, if it, again, I get back to reinforcement. Mm -hmm. If they learn a lot here, but when it gets out there, it gets diminished, then I yep. think I, I'm hoping for a bigger bang for that, for that butt well, and I effort. I can tell you that we've already implemented some of this on a smaller scale in this last in-service. We did have some very uncomfortable conversations in some of our in-services. Um, and what I see with, with 20 years, I feel like a millennial of police work, right? Because in my career, the transition of police work has been kind of what it was when we had like tapes and then CDs and then stuff that no one ever heard of. It's so fast at a time when police work culture changed and it's primed for it. And I know that most people want to be a fly on the wall, but without exception, every single time we've left a class, there have been a plethora of text messages or private conversations that said, I'm glad someone said that because I didn't, I wasn't ready to. Mm -hmm. And I think I think it's the state of our nation. I think what gets the most coverage is the loudest on either side of the spectrum when the rest of us are somewhere in the middle just trying to find a way to be heard. 
Um, and I think that this is a step in that right direction. And I think that we're primed for it right now. And, and yes, we will be doing it in our academy, but also in our in-service repeatedly and challenging those ideas and those thoughts. I'm really excited about it. Um, we've put a lot of time into it thus far. And So if I may. You I may. I hate to be hogging it here. But well, you're hogging it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear, now these conversations or these pairings, I guess, would they be with uh, the candidates and officers solely, or would uh, citizen volunteers uh, be coming in and, and participating? Yeah, I, th I think my goal as the training director has been to incorporate more and more trainers without a law enforcement background, mm -hmm. because I think that brings perspective and I think it brings legitimacy to um, some of the feedback we've gotten on some of our previous over the years um, canned products, if you will, for bias-based policing is the feeling that you tried to get someone, there was someone who looked the part, but who like thinked with the other people in the room. And we are trying to go with putting people in front who don't like think, but can withstand the pushback, right? Um, and I think we're primed to do that. Um, I don't mind being the middleman moderator to, as you said, throw the people out of the room who need to be or put them in check um, because we have to have those difficult conversations. You, you, change doesn't come in a comfort zone, so. I'm listening carefully to what you say, and I agree with something you just said about, it used to be the standard that if we were gonna have uh, this kind of training, it had to be a minority to provide it, because it, if it, supposedly if, if they were a minority, then uh, they gave more weight to it or mm -hmm. something, but everybody should be able to give this training regardless. So yeah. I actually think it's more important to have someone who understands it and is more passionate. Yeah. And I think sometimes we, it, it is a minority that's selected. And um, I've challenged a couple who, and have said, you need to lead this training with that. Mm -hmm. I'm here because someone thought I was the right person for this job. And mm -hmm. that's an authentic place to start because why? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and would it be more relevant to hear from someone who looks like you? that you might be biased and it's okay to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. Or from someone who's just gonna be written off as, well, you're only saying that because of your background. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at all of those pieces. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I think that's awesome, because we need to have those crucial conversations. That's what I call them, crucial. Karen. A couple more. <laughs> how much time, how, how much time will be in, people be engaged in this experience? Um, we haven't, decided that yet we're building our library right now so if we if we talk about from a conceptualization that's the best way I can tell you what we intend to do we're building our library I looked at the first um, the first one I we had a conversation about do we test this training concept with a recruit class um, and universally those of us that were involved said actually I think it's better if we start with the toughest audience right and I think that the mayor hit that when he said it's very difficult to reach people who are set in their ways and who have done the same things that they've always done so that's where we want to start um, and I, I don't know what that time frame looks like I know our end game is to be able to build a four-hour block of training that grows every year based on what we built and is in every in-service and is reinforced repeatedly but with new content um, and then work from there so we've been working on this since about uh well i would say right before the first of the year and again our intent is to roll it out our training year switches july 1. so our intent is to be ready to go with our first round of this in july obviously i'm thrilled i mean that's why i made sure that the chair knew and that we got a chance to hear that from you i do know that what you and I have mutually learned, I mean, part of the mosaic concept is that you're engaged for nine months, that, mm -hmm. that it's not just a one-off. It's not just like watching a good movie, reading a good book, having one good conversation or sitting in on it, but, but having to pick buck those threads back up and go out again right? At, until such time, and it, it has happened in most cases, that, that a, 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 a deep mutual understanding is developed that trust is developed, and in, in most, um, a lifelong friendship, because it's, it's, it's when you finally can say, when somebody suggests you need to do 
better hiring, mm -hmm. better training, recruit people to boards and committees and things like that. Where, where all that training falls apart is then when whoever, whatever color they are, whatever background they are, says, well, I don't know anybody. Mm -hmm. and, and it stops because we grow and stretch with those relationships. And so I'm, I'm interested to see how, how that works, um, how you feel like the time has worked or whether you, you pick it up again, sure. you know, whether there's a, a sequence. Um, I'm excited about that. A, a thought across the table I'd share with one, one of the best. I, I, too, was in diversity training every year. I mean, as a mm -hmm. chair of a nonprofit or a CEO, we did it all the time. It was just part of what we did. One of the best trainings I ever went to, because the conferences I went to did that as well, was some guys from Chicago who led with, okay, we all know what the seven protected classes, there was seven at the time, but we want to talk with you all about what it was about you that made you feel different. Big blackboard up there. And all of a sudden, it, it, it was things like, well, I had curly hair. Or I was an army brat. We moved all the time. I didn't have a home. I didn't have a persona where I lived. And, and I'll throw this out. One of the things I said was the guys who were not circumcised, there was locker room stuff. It was just very hard to fit in. Well, you don't think of those things either in terms of diversity. We've been adding veterans as almost a protected class lately. But it was what it did was poked at each individual. It helped them bring back their own experience of feeling like they didn't fit, whatever it was. And that was kind of a fascinating process to see, too, to open up those conversations. So I wanted to share that since you were yep. talking about it. Question across the table, you may be involved in that, but Chief, after one of our early sessions, something that struck me was that you can do the training, you can, you can do the supervision, but if the personnel, you know, and you can say these are now our priorities of what we're going to do, but if the personnel review doesn't reflect those standards, then are we really measuring whether our officers have demonstrated those skills, attitudes, demeanors, and so on? And I may not remember it. I know you and I sat down at one point and talked about it. And there were at least three things that when I looked at the personnel review for the officers, they were things we were talking about that were really, really important. But because they were sort of a new way to look at things, I guess, they weren't included in the personnel reviews. And I think they may have been, you know, demonstrating bias or not, um, an ability to de-escalate, to either keep a situation at a de-escalated level or get it there as fast as optimally as possible. Um, and also um, the concept of that's now being taught through the ABLE program that not to go ahead and speak up if somebody's not handling a situation appropriately. Um, have there been any changes yet in the personnel reviews to pick up on the priorities that have been identified in this journey we've had? Well, I would disagree just a hair, I guess. I might not have remembered, right, yeah. <laughs> which was the three were. I yeah. know there were three. Well, I, I, think it, I think what we talked about, and I think the general gist that we've covered on a number of topics in this committee, has been how language changes and how language matters and how sometimes forms, like personnel evaluation forms, don't change with any frequency and so therefore right. they don't adopt the language that necessarily is occurring because some of the things that you just talked about I would say are covered in the being professional and integrity and ethics but I think what we talked about was were they specifically listed in current language in those personnel things and I, and I think that's important I think so as well so I think that's what it is it's always a challenge to keep your your policies and it's definitely a challenge to keep your forms um, updated so I would just say that I, I think those things have always been there, but whether they were specifically listed in that manner. But you're absolutely right about ABLE, and I think we're talking about this topic. We would mention ABLE because that culture, um, we're still one of the few agencies in the state of Kansas that has adopted that Georgetown law practice. And, and that, that culture and that commitment to dedication of peer intervention overlaps in all of these things. 
all of these things are very important as far as having your open heart and mind to conversations, crucial conversations. But, you know, the ABLE training, too, is about that peer intervention. So we've had that for a while. So those are kind of different, different conversations, but they're also <laughs> interrelated. So that's the only thing I would say is I don't know that the, the, the personnel form has been changed because that's a, a little broader conversation that has to happen with human resources here for the city. Um, I think there's topics that you talked about are covered, but the language needed to be updated. And we have done some of that in the policy, and we have done some of that in the training manual. That's what I would tell you from my administrative experience is the place to start. We'll get to the forms. Um, but as I stand here before you today, I can't tell you that the, the forms have been changed because they haven't. Um, but we're working through the language that we, we're working through the personnel part of it by changing the language in the training manual and the policies first. Yes, I think. I think it's probably been more than six months since we had that conversation. And I think you said then, well, I wouldn't be able to do it right away, but it's it's being worked on or right. something like that. Well, that, that civil service board that oversees our hiring process is now meeting quarterly, and those changes are being discussed. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we, we don't have the ability to change them. It goes through that civil service board, the human resources aspect. But, but we can show them the validity of the changes yeah. first in the ch in the training manual, and I think that's where we're starting. I think so, and I also think if, if we've identified as a committee or you as, as seniors in the department that those are areas that the language does need to be updated so that nobody misses it. I personally like the way your forms were. It was, it was new to me where instead of having 15 different boxes to check, you kind of listed the different things so that there was an opportunity to review each one and, but then the scoring was done on, I assume, something that seemed like it was worth talking about, either giving somebody credit for doing a really great job at it or making a note that they needed some improvement in that area. But I, I think when you and I went through it, the wording was not such that it would jump out at you sure. um, in terms of these things. And so if, if what I'm hearing is it's, it's still in process, I mean, when you all identify something that you think needs to be updated, do you submit suggested uh, updates or at least some comments that these areas ought to be looked at? I think what we do is we start with the pieces that we control unilaterally first, lay the foundation for it, because uh -huh. that's what I've seen in my administrative career work. Um, so that, that's what I would tell you in regards to that. But I think what you're talking about, too, kind of speaks to what the mayor was talking about. It's really about and I certainly have an appreciation for forms, but it's about the daily conversations between the supervisors and the troops on the street in real time, in real situations and circumstances that we have. The buy-in that we have to get from our supervisors and our employees that changes the culture. I can assure you we'll, we'll get the paperwork where it needs to be, but it, that part of the ABLE and then building on these open discussions um, and having the crucial conversations on a daily basis to me, is where I want to put our priority and our enforcement because I believe it's going to provide us the, the biggest results. The paperwork absolutely is oh. important, and we'll get there. And, and I, if I may, I absolutely agree. The deal is if it's not there at the end of the line, sometimes that doesn't back into those daily conversations. I'm, the one, I'm one of the people, not the only one, who early on when it was like, well, we got this training and we changed our policy here, said, fine. <laughs> And this is kind of raw, but I don't care. Is it is it being demonstrated on the street? Because if it's not, right. and, and so we've been working on all those pieces of it, I think. And I just wanted to make sure, you know, your your review and an appropriate HR process is never the first conversation about anything. It's just your checkbox that actually that the that the field supervision and the the training has gone well and that uh, everybody was doing their part, not just that individual. Yeah, so. But I think, I, I think there's a credence to the part that we're talking about, though. I mean, we can't say one thing here and then say another thing here. I mean, no. the priority is the day-to-day -day reinforcement, the belief. If you really want culture change, that's what it's about. It's not about changing the paperwork. We'll get there. But it's about that, that belief system uh, that overlapping culture of peer intervention, that being the standard that is put forth. Uh, I guess that's, that's where I'm at. I mean, this, this, this is all about this training and, and where the new generation of law enforcement going is about the interaction at the individual level. And it's about learning and appreciating all of the differences and, and taking what you can get from that and bringing it in. Um, 
So, I mean, I'd like to have a lot more hours in the day that we have, and, and you know, the, the training director is right for the effort that she's put in for it, which has been Herculean, and she needs some praise for that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where our focus is right now, because I believe that that's where the change occurs is the shortest answer that I have for it. And that's, that's me. That's my decision. Um, I'll, I'll take that. That's on me. I, I, I agree, but it, it, it's like anything, and I'm not trying to be critical because I'm, I'm so excited about all of these things. But it's sort of like saying it's against the law to shoot people, but there's no consequences, <laughs> which is your life all the time. It's no, if, if it doesn't work out, you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> so Right. Well, I, I, like I said, I, I would say that we've always had policies in place and, and that have been enforceable in regards to um, ethics violations and, and lack of professionalism. So, uh, but it's a broader conversation now, and it's it an ongoing it expectation changing that's based on conversations with our community, and I think that's exactly where it needs to be. Yeah, well, I agree. And thank you for, for all of it. I'm excited about all of it. So don't want that to be misunderstood. No, I don't think it was, and we, we certainly are used to answering questions. So. Is that all? Mike? No, I'm good. Thank you, Chair. You're good? Okay. Jennifer, thank you. Thank you for coming in today. Um, you can stick around, but I think you're more valuable somewhere else besides <laughs> sitting here. Congrats to Kevin for me. Okay, let's go back and um, let's approve the minutes. I for, make a motion to approve. Okay, it's been moved. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Okay, 3 0, Liz. Uh, the next is a um, presentation by Police Chief um, regarding defunding the police. That was Thank a, you. a Thank very you, big topic. Um, still not sure that I'm pleased with, that I'm going to be pleased with just this, not anything against you, Chief. Um, but um, that scream has has come and go. Um, I've heard it come and go over these past uh, or over these years that since we've taken over here, since we've been doing this. Let me say that. Um, so I, I I really you know when I have that conversation with people, um, it's I, I I ask them how do you define defund. You know, because to me, they're saying take away your money. So if we take away your money, what is that going to present? And I know that there's other cities that have done that, and they don't have a police department or whatever. But I'll, I'll go ahead and, and let you present. So thank okay. you. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity to present, as I always do. Um, and, and to be very forthwith, I, I, I found this to be a little bit of a challenge, um, to be the one that was presenting on this, but I tried to look at it from a, from a research and from an analytical perspective, and I, and I tried to give um, a, a wide variety of opinions on there, and, and, and I'm gonna apologize right out of the front because I will be reading some quotes as we move through this presentation, but I think it goes to capture um, the mindset of a lot of leaders that we have uh, who are obviously much, much more intelligent than I am on this particular topic, so that's what I'll do. So defund the police presentation, and I think that's exactly right. I think we need to start this conversation with a little bit of context for what this committee was formed and, and how this particular topic relates to that committee's uh, tasking. Committee, this committee was formed in August of 2020. It was tasked with examining a variety of police department topics uh, with community input. Uh, those topics were to be decided by the community, and I know that the, we got a list early on and, and that the list grew as we moved along. Uh, defund the police movement was among those original topics in uh, 2020 um, to be discussed. So when I started doing some research um, and, and I looked back then and I, and I looked forward to current and I'll try to cover all of that. Um, but for some, as, as the chair pointed out, there's a lot of variance in what defund the police means to a lot of different people. And I think this kind of information when I was doing some research on it kind of showed some of that. But for some, defund the police is a movement, a stepping stone towards abolishing police departments entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, for others, the idea of defunding the police is limited to simply restricting money for military style equipment. And for others, there should be police, but their role in communities should be limited to crime prevention. 
the idea is that the service agencies other than the police could and should respond to nonviolent calls for service. So that kind of shows a, at least a few different perspectives. There are several more, um, but that's at least some of the broad categories that I found. And, and like you said, it, it's not an easiest thing as you would think um, to define what it is, but that the simple version that you gave is absolutely one of them too, uh, as far as just taking away the money in general. A little bit of background here, um, I think, to educate the public in, in, in general. Across this country, most of the time, it is a policy decision um, by elected officials or policy makers, at least, um, governmental oversight entities that determine police departments' fundings. We are usually a piece of a larger uh, government machine uh, and don't decide our own funding sources uh, generally. In 2021, 2020 and through 2021, more than 20 major cities across the country engaged in police department specific budget, budget reduction initiatives. And I, and I use that language because there were lots of cities that cut budgets for lots of different reasons over the years. Um, and that's not really helpful for this particular discussion that's about defunding the police. So um, that language you will see throughout the presentation. Police department specific budget reduction initiatives. Um, if because you were doing COVID uh, scenarios and you cut across the board, that's not really the same thing that we're talking about here. Uh, in that period of time, in those major cities and all across the country, there was more than $870 million in direct cuts to police departments uh, as a result of this movement. And then I listed a lot of major cities, New York, Portland, Minneapolis, Los Angeles, Chicago, Seattle, Milwaukee, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Chicago, and others um, that reduced police budgetary spending in 2021 as well. One of the things that you hear a great deal about when, at least currently, uh, when you're talking about this topic is also, and, and the chair alluded to it too when she started this presentation, uh, at least with a facial expression, was you see the concern that at least some of the constituents raised in regards to crime rates going up and, and crime increases. And so that list, I've left this before I changed the screen here, that list of cities, major cities that I, that I rolled off at the bottom that were part of the 20 major cities that cut uh, spending. And you can see in 2021, um, Chicago, this is homicide increases in 2021 after those cuts. Chicago was up by 22%. Seattle was up by 22%. Minneapolis was up by 56%. Portland was up by 530%. I had to double check that number to make sure that was accurate because it was fairly um, unbelievable. Los Angeles was up by 11%. Baltimore was up 26%. And then you see at the bottom, Philadelphia, 561 murders in 2021, the most in that city's entire history of recording of homicides. So that's national cities. That's a national perspective. Um, as we all know, um, sometimes history judges us all. And uh, we see as time passes some of the effects of some of these things. But those are all national cities all across the country. Um, I was able to locate something that was a little bit more close to, <coughs> to home, if you will, uh, here in the Kansas City area. Um, we had a, a similar occurrence in May of 2021 that I thought, as I did some research on it, I was able to, that I thought bore out kind of a little bit more of a, a local example, but also a little bit more of a detailed one. Um, so in May of 2021, Mayor Lucas, with the support of several city council members, passed an ordinance to defund the police department, and that was the actual language in the ordinance, uh, $44 million, which was, in their, in their setup, was the lowest the city can devote to police funding under Missouri law. A quote from one of the councilwomen who was not in favor of it, this is absolutely the worst piece of legislation since I've been here at City Hall. You take $46 million out of the police budget and who gets hurt the most is our families, our children. How do they stay safe and secure if there are no, if there are no police around? That was Councilwoman Teresa Lohr. Uh, the chief of police in Kansas City, Missouri, Richard Smith, responded with, we are down 116 officers and do not have the budget to replace them. In short, our current hiring freeze is setting the department back in adequate staffing for years to come. So in May of 2021, after that city ordinance uh, was passed by the council, the Missouri Attorney General got involved and filed a, filed a lawsuit in uh, Jackson County, Missouri court and his perspective on to stop the, uh, the budget reduction that had been enacted. 
Kansas City's short-sighted move to defund their police department will have lasting, destructive, and deadly consequences for its residents. Last year, 176 people were murdered in Kansas City, marking the deadliest year in the city's history. Despite this grim milestone, the city council and mayor's decisions will potentially eliminate approximately 480 sworn officer positions. Attempts to defund the police will deprive Kansas City residents of a needed police presence and exacerbate homicide and violent crime rates plaguing Kansas City and major cities across Missouri and the country. And that from Missouri Attorney General Eric Schmidt. So the case goes to court, and as we play it out on the, on the next bullet point, October of 2021, the Jackson County Court Judge um, found it to be an illegal action, and the funds were restored to the police department. The Attorney General weighed in with, this is a huge win for the people of Kansas City and law enforcement officers who work every single day to keep their communities safe. I will always stand up for Missouri's law enforcement and fight back against craven attempts to defund the police. Again, Attorney General Schmidt. Uh, Mayor Lucas, was his comment was, uh, these are subjects of vigorous social debate and should be finally resolved by a healthy democracy. So I think that's an important point. You know, I think he understood, at least from what I've read, um, that he was that this was going to libelly end up in, in. It certainly was a possibility that it would be litigated, um, but that he felt like it was a topic that needed to be reviewed by a court and then went through the democratic process. So I certainly had an appreciation for that as well. Kansas City, Missouri, or Kansas City stats: uh, the two deadliest, the two deadliest years on the city's recorded history. Um, 2020, they had 179 homicides. 2021, 157 <laughs> homicides. And when I did this slide, when I originally built this presentation in 2022, they'd had 35 homicides, and that's why I said so far. I looked it up uh, yesterday before I came to update it. It's actually 46 homicides now, so far. So that kind of stands where they're at, statistical comparison from, from some of these cities. But that gives us a local case study of how it was handled um, here in our region. So as we look at uh, Topeka, Kansas, we didn't have any police department only specific budget reductions in 2021. Um, the, the common message at the budget meetings um, that I was attended from Topeka residents was to fully staff and fund the public safety enemies, entities as a, uh, a top priority. You can see the crime statistics in, we had here in Topeka in 2021, a three-year low in summer crime, three-year low in shootings, six-year low in, in homicides, and a significant decrease in violent and property crime. Um, to that, I would add, since I told you what Kansas City's homicides that they've had so far, which is 46, we've had one um, shooting comparison in the first quarter, which we're almost to the end of the first quarter. First quarter of 2021, we had 21 shootings. The first quarter of uh, 2020, I'm sorry, the first quarter of 2020, we had 21 shootings. The first quarter of 2021, we had 32 shootings. And so far in the first quarter of 2022, we've had 11. So we're down two thirds of shootings so far in the first quarter of 2022. So Beyond that, beyond just the, the numbers, because I know numbers can be a little bit dry for people, but in 2021 when I was the interim, and, and certainly in 2022 um, as I've been the permanent chief, I have done a whole bunch of meetings um, with a whole bunch of different people, business leaders, religious leaders, community service organizations, school leaders, government leaders, and other concerned citizens. And I can tell you the one thing that I take away from the common theme that I have meetings when I do them one-on-one -on -one with with people or with groups is they want more police at their events and locations, not less. I, I feel a lot of calls from business leaders who want officers at, at their strip mall or at their event center. I certainly get that from organizations. I, I reach out, I get reached out to a lot in regards to different community religious organizations that have events going on. They want more police, not less, is the general theme that I get from this community and, and the presence that, that I, or at least the meetings that I have. So, and, and many of those citizens and constituents have, have said to me, without any doubt, um, I think the uh, USD 501 school district is probably one of the biggest advocates of that as well. I mean, I, they certainly would like more SROs, not less. Um, and all of those common theme from those citizens and leaders in this community has been that it adds to the overall safety uh, perception. So I feel very fortunate uh, every day 
to be the, the chief of police here in the Topeka, Kansas Police Department, not only because of the amazing staff I work with and around, uh, but, all, but also the community that we serve. We have a, a lot of support from our city leadership. We have a lot of support from the community. I think, uh, and I, like I said, it may sound a little self-serving in this context, but I, I think our city leadership didn't make any knee-jerk reactions and actually stayed the course. And, and I think that historically, uh, as we see the last few years with some of the, the crime instances that are occurring in some of these cities that made those decisions, we certainly didn't make what I consider to be the mistake based on where we are now in 2022 with, uh, with the community safety that we have. So those are kind of the city perspectives, um, my perspective based on the crime numbers. But I also wanted to add, like I said, I wanted to kind of approach this like a research project and kind of kind of do some background on it. So this was a, a often cited uh, University of Yale University study. Um, it took place over eight weeks and they surveyed more than 1,100 people. And they asked them the question about how they felt about reforming, defunding, and this is quoted as you can see, reforming, defunding, or abolishing, or and abolishing police. Um, they, they finished that study and published those results in January of 2022 in the issue of criminology and public policy. And this is what they found. Less than a quarter, 23%, said they supported abolishing police departments. Slightly over a third, 34%, said they supported defunding the police departments. In contrast, a strong majority, 66% 66 only supported police reform. Uh, that survey was conducted while a lot of the protests were going on, were underway in 2020, even though they just got around and got the data compiled and then published it in 2022. Um, and the department chair for Yale University over the study, his name is Greg Huber, said the following quote, it seems very clear that the public is not comfortable with reducing or getting rid of police. They would just like the police to behave differently. We've seen big increases in crime rates in many cities. What this tells us is that the public is going to be skeptical of reducing the number of police on the streets. They're worried that crime would go up. So all of those things kind of lead us to where we are now. And I, as I researched a lot of really recent uh, news articles, I was struck by one of the things that was common, and, and sometimes you just you get a lot of things from just the headlines, but one of the common headlines was where we are now in 2022, from defund to refund. Um, and so I just thought it was useful to, to cite some of these headlines as I was doing some research. And as you can see, 2022 New York Times article, a year after defund, police departments get their money back. And that was from the New York Times. Uh, 2022 Newsweek article, America's big, biggest cities to invest 450 million more in police following the 2020 defund movement. 2022 CNN uh, article or story, Department of Justice allots $1.6 billion to cities due to violent crime rise. Justice Department boosts funds to cities to battle rise in crime. And then the last one I cited was uh, 2022 NBC News, uh, how Democrats went from defund to refund the police. And I tried to, as we talked about, it was interesting when the mayor mentioned earlier, you know, what news station you watch might be a, an implicit bias thing. And that, that was kind of an interesting comment because I, I really tried when I was working on this to, to go media outlets from different genres to kind of show what the, the deal is. And we'll, we'll see a little bit more of that with some of the quotes that I do as we move forward. But that's 20, those are all 2022 articles, kind of a, in a historical retrospective of where we are now um, from where we were then. So this next slide, like I said, this is the part where I want to apologize. But I, as I was doing it, um, I was trying to figure out a way to show where we are now from a, a broad perspective of, of leaders across the political spectrum. Um, and there wasn't really a way to capture it without a bunch of quotes because I couldn't encapsulate what all of these smart people have said beyond just with me trying to frame it. So you'll, I, I ask for your indulgence a little bit as I read through some of these quotes. But anyway, uh, Democratic leadership, um, two major parties. I think it was a correction to the defund conversation, which I personally think went too far and got convoluted. Uh, Oakland mayor, Oakland, California mayor, Libby Schaaf. Uh, the next quote is from New York City Mayor Eric Adams. When you start defunding, hey, the cop is no longer on your corner. That cop is no longer in your lobby. That cop is not standing outside when you leave your Broadway play. And I have never been to an event where the people were saying, we want less cops. 
Never. That was the mayor of New York. Uh, our own governor, uh, Laura Kelly, defund the police is unfortunate phrasing. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of discussion as you do research on this um, about how politicized that defund the police actually that phrase um, became. Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, defund the police is dead. Public safety is our responsibility. Defund the police is not the policy of the Democratic Party. Again, that was the Speaker of the House. Um, and then, of course, um, President Joe Biden. The answer is not to defund the police, but instead to provide the tools and funding for law, enfor law enforcement officials to be partners and protectors in the community. The answer is not to abandon our streets. That's not the answer. The answer is to come together, police and communities building trust and making us all safer. Um, a point that he reiterated in the State of the Union address that he made on March 1st, 2022, where he specifically said fund, not defund the police. So that's where we are in 2022 from the Democratic leadership side. Um, the Republican leadership side, to reverse the tide of rising crime, we need to stop demonizing and sabotaging the dedicated men and women who risk their lives every single day to keep the rest of us safe. Instead, we're going to refund the police. Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, um, our own U.S. Senator uh, from Kansas, Roger Marshall. What America doesn't realize is what we ask out of our police officers. The thought of defunding the police, I mean, that's got to be the tail wagging the dog. Americans don't want to defund the police. Uh, U.S. Senate Leader Mitch McConnell. From coast to coast, American families are facing an explosion of violent crime on their streets and in their neighborhoods. Defunding the police isn't just a terrible idea for overall public safety. It's also a uniquely awful strategy for racial justice. One study recently confirmed that, quote, larger police forces save lives and the lives saved are disproportionately black lives. What I do know is that ordinary Americans cannot bear much more of this, and that goes double for the most vulnerable neighborhoods. So I think after I did all of that research and put all of that together, I said, okay, so where are we at now? And there's a, there's a great deal when you're doing research on this topic from a, a, a purely academic standpoint. There's a great deal of discussion of language use. Um, and so I thought it was interesting to see how you see from both sides of the aisle, the defunding the police has become very political. And, and there's a lot of people who are moving away from that terminology. So I thought it was useful as this overall discussion to, to bring up some of the alternative phrasing that was being instituted in um, as we move through more into 2022. Public safety reimagined, police reform still, one of the things that's used quite a bit, and then refined justice. So that is what I found um, from an informational purpose or from an informational standpoint um, in regards to what a lot of cities did in 2020, where, where the crime rates went after that, um, what, and, and also litigation that, <laughs> that resulted, um, what we did here and where we are now um, as far as the crime rate perspective, and then kind of a overall leadership at the local state and national level um, on this topic of defund police as we sit here in 2022. Um, and then I just wanted to close with the, uh, the mission statement of the Topeka Police Department, which is to provide a safe community and faithfully serve our citizens with impeccable integrity, enduring professionalism, and immeasurable honor. And uh, I can tell you every time I say that, I get a little choked um, because it means a great deal to me. And so I am, I, I, once again, I am proud um, to lead this agency, and I'm proud to be a part of this city. That's all I have to say. I'll open up myself for questions. Thank you. Do we have any questions for the chief? Kind of make a statement and yeah. tell me if I recall this correctly. When I heard the conversations about defund the police, to what I heard most out of that was this concern about mental health and social service professionals versus police, and were we expecting the police to serve those roles? And should we, when some, when to the best of people's knowledge, when the situation was based on a, a, even domestic violence or, or, or mental health-based kinds of issues, should we send those professionals instead of the police? 
and thus or you know divert funding from police to funding those sorts of things and the sense that I got and of course I knew a fair amount going into that was that the Topeka was way ahead of the curve or at least up up in the front of the line with how strongly we'd interfaced with domestic violence folks with mental health folks in the past and had teamed up with them and that often went together or that the alerts went out together anyway to, to kind of triage whatever the circumstances were, yet at the same time with this discussion of either or, that there was a sense here anyway, and I, don't, I haven't researched it nationally, that people really liked having a police officer there because their training, their presence, and their training in de-escalation and managing situations that might get volatile, most people thought was very important. Did I, did I read that right? I think, I think a lot of those um, subsidiary conversations got kind of lost in the political. And, and I've, I've had some meetings with community members, <laughs> and, and uh -huh. we, we've talked about how it was unfortunate that the defund the police movement got so polarizing from a political right. standpoint that you really couldn't have some of the Lost conversations. Lost the substance. Right. Uh, like I said, a lot of people talk about related issues like, are we really talking about reallocation? Are we really talking right. about cooperation and collaboration? Uh -huh. I think you're 100% right. Um, the police department here, because of leadership that we've had in the past, had us so far ahead on the co-responder programs and our CIT responses where we were out in the field already right. um, with police officers and mental health workers in collaboration that some of the programs that the major cities wanted to reallocate money to were yeah. already in place here at the police department from a collaborative basis. So I, I think that's a I think that's a very, very valid and astute point that a lot of the the reforms, you will, or the, the movements that they wanted to do with the reallocation of the money were already programs that we had built through partnerships um, across the city. So I think that's a really good point. Um, but it definitely got to my two cents, not even all of the amazing leaders that I quoted, but my, my two cents is we did get lost a little bit in, in politics and, and kind of lost an opportunity to have some of those conversations. But I, I think we were in a better place, and I think a lot of the programs that you see across the country now um, where they're moving to those of is this the right call for a police officer to respond to uh -huh. you know we learned a lot of those lessons when we were building these programs uh -huh. and you hear from a lot of mental health professionals who've been in that program in the past and who are currently in that field not necessarily with the police department program that they have concerns about their safety that that's that's a that's a real part of the collaboration and the partnership to go and do these things so uh -huh. um I do smile with a, with a big sense of pride, and I take no credit for it because it was in place long before I was here. When I see programs in other communities where they're talking about rolling out mental health officers and, and police officers, because we've been doing that for a while, um, and so you know, I, I I'm proud of the, the capital city here in in our, in our state, and I'm proud of the Midwest. And I think sometimes the coasts kind of do look down that that they're ahead of us, but they weren't ahead of us on this one. Um, and I and I think that they. Quite frankly, with, with the decisions the council made, I think they weren't ahead of us in regards to how we handled this either. Um, uh, that's just my two cents. But I think that's a big part of it. We were already doing a lot of the programs that, that they're hailing as new reforms now. But the idea of discussing police reform mm -hmm. is still a very much a live conversation that's ongoing and will be ongoing. Um, and I think it's very obvious in some of the other things we continue to talk about training and where are we at with these critical conversations mm -hmm. we're, we're having we're having some of those now it's not a perfect world and we have a lot of work to do absolutely but we didn't start from a place i think is the point you're making where a lot of these agencies did and where a lot of these cities did but we also didn't go too far um and do anything that had a long-term negative impact on our on our crime too because Last thing I want to say is the I will tell you I'm reading a book right now on uh, the biography of William Barr, the former United States Attorney General, and he talks about that social programs and police departments are have to be collaborative and are augmented. They're never going to replace a police department, and a police department is never going to replace social programs. They they have to work together, but everything starts with 
safety and security. If you don't have, and he talks about his experience in Chicago, and, and if you don't have safety and security, training programs, education programs, and all of those things in neighborhoods cannot take root if, if people are not safe, if, if, if gangs and crimes are running the neighborhoods. None of those programs are going to take. So you have to establish safety and security first, and then you can work through the social programs. So it's, in my career, it's, it's, it's all about collaboration. It's all about that. Appreciate that, and 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 I and I support that too. Um, I don't want to trap you with this question, so if, if you don't want to answer it, that's fine. But you've had a lot of conversations with folks who either use that term, defund the police, or wanted to talk about those issues. Do you have Do you have a sense that in the conversations you've had, that at this point, the the folks who express concerns are satisfied with with what we're doing? I have to tell you that, and obviously, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's people that I'm meeting with and talking right. with, but it's been very interesting to me, and it was, these conversations took place before this, this tasking of, of this presentation, but it, it was very interesting to me. A lot of the people that wanted to start that conversation also started with an explanation that they understood the problems with starting a conversation with defunding the police, mm -hmm. um, especially it's not lost on me, especially talking to the police chief. But <laughs> I, I think, I think that, that there's a real understanding, at least I would say, since you asked me my opinion, there's a real understanding that I don't know that that language is very helpful to anybody who wants to have a conversation. And so I, I've, I've had more people who started a conversation with me about that and explained that that's not what they meant or the viewpoint of this particular group is not what they believe defund the police means. And really when it gets down to it, it, it's more about reallocation. It's more about efficiency. It's more about conversation and, and collaboration. It, it, I can tell you what I hear. You guys hear the same thing I do um, a lot about different topics, but this community very much believes at a core level that this community needs to decide what's best for this community. That specifically to Topeka, that nobody knows Topeka's issues like Topeka's. Um, and so that's what I hear a lot from people. But I actually get more conversations that start about apologizing or stepping away from a, a too far view of, of defund the police. But there are a lot of conversations about where we can reallocate money or, or where we can best use efficiencies, how we can holistically use um, <laughs> services. Uh, and, and it's one of the cool... You know, it's one of the coolest things about being the police chief because I get to meet with a lot of people um, who I might not have had the opportunity to, and I get to hear their perspective, and I take things away from all of those meetings. Um, but I, I can't put it much better than what I, I think. You know, when you have the president and the speaker of the house saying defund the police is not where we are at, then I, I think that's a pretty good picture of 2022. But police reform is an ongoing topic and has historically always been an important move forward for social justice and racial justice. And I, I, don't, I don't shy away from that either. I think that's an important responsibility. And, and I understand we're, we are out front. We are always the most visible, accessible, especially local police department is the most visible and accessible face of government. Um, so we, we have a lot of responsibility when it comes to that. But I've enjoyed all of the conversations I've had. Um, but I don't, I don't hear as much about defund uh, as I do, but I, I think reform um, and I, I like to justice reimagine because if you're not, there's a, there's a basic law of nature. If you're not evolving, you're deteriorating, you're, you're dying. So I'm, I'm all about justice reimagine. That rings with me. So I like that one. If, if I could wrap up, I'm pretty sure that all those groups appreciated those conversations. Um, and we've talked about a lot of things so far. Are there any issues that came up in those small group or one-on-one -on -one conversations that we haven't yet addressed in, no, this, in this no, group? No, no, th this committee has done a, no, I, I would say no. This, this committee has done a, a very comprehensive deep dive, um, which I have appreciated the opportunity to present the police department and educate the community. But no, I, I wouldn't say there's anything that I would say is, oh, we, have, we missed this. I wouldn't. Might be getting ahead of the chair, but I think she told us we were going to try and wrap this up. So, <laughs> since you've been the on the front line, no, me... I, I, 
I haven't heard, there was nothing that I, if you were asking me for a suggestion, there's nothing that I would say. Um, and I reviewed the list the other day um, that we had on the website of all the different presentations and stuff. And okay. I, I think it's, and I actually was giving that information to uh, one of my fellow chiefs and, uh, of all of the ground that we've covered in the committee. So it, when I was looking at it from that context, I was like, there's a lot of ground that's mm -hmm. been covered, so. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a lot. Um, I know that there's been some people that are disappointed it's taken me this long <laughs> and that would have done it different. Mm -hmm. My colleague over here has told me that. Not, she has told me that. Fine. But this is the thing. I have a due diligence to make sure that we have covered everything that was presented to us. Mm -hmm. And if you go back and you go back through your notes, you will see that people, they actually were saying, I want this, I want this, I want this, and we tied it all together. I, I sat down with Liz and we tried to tie these things together because we could go on and on. And I know we do have to wrap this up. But at the same time, I don't want to go back and have somebody say, well, I presented this to you and this was like to fund. I didn't know how we were going to do it. I didn't, I don't, I, I don't even know if the committee is, is satisfied with what we've done because there's so many, there's so many ways that you can define to fund the police. It just, it just depends on who you ask. Mm -hmm. And there were people that said, take their money away. I have a guy and he bought his whole family guns and said, I say defund the police. I bought my family guns and let's go back to the Western days. I'm like, well, I don't want to go back to the Western days, you know, because we got some people that can shoot better than the other. And I expressed to them, the main person that's going to hurt is the minorities, the people that can afford guns or the people that, you know, the, uh, are the low to moderate income people, you know, is it. It, it's just not a good topic. It was not. A, it was not a good topic, and I've heard it, and I still hear it over and over and over again. I'm telling you, when I go home, it'll be on my machine. I think we just need to take all their money. <laughs> and I said, maybe, and that's what we're looking into. Just a bright new policy, or not? Maybe not even policy just to make sure that they can look through the lens of other people that just want to see you guys understand where they're coming from. That guy that's going home at, the, at 12 o'clock at night um, has his tail light out, but just because he's a minority. And I still say minority, I've been corrected for that. I say it because of this. You know, when you start saying people of color, that doesn't always put everybody in there that should be in there, so that's why. And so they just want, they just want to be understood too. And, and I think there was a lot of, with George Floyd's situation, there was a lot of unrest. I, I get that. I understand that. It was terrifying to see that. But at the same time, we need to look at, from both sides, what's, what's really best for all of us. And you're right. What fits Topeka? What fits Topeka? So having said all that, did you have anything to add to that, Mike, before I move on? No, I, I don't want to go too long. Well, just a quick. Yeah, we've been in meetings all day. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. But, you know, at the outset of this uh, committee's charge, mm -hmm. um, I don't know that everybody agreed that was the way that this should have yep. moved forward. But for me, I kept thinking over and over that uh, suggestions or demands in many cases that were being made I don't want to say were unnecessary but were on topics and uh, subject matter that like you said the department has always been open to being adaptive to and relevant to the community needs so I always felt we were in pretty good shape as a city um, what we, I thought, needed to do a better job of, and that was letting people know to what extent the department has gone to train itself to to be relevant in this in this day and age. Uh, you know, I would get comments all the time. You know, email, 
if you don't know what you're talking about, I, I suggest you go to Citizens Academy to find out what it's really like. Well, that tells me they, those people don't have a clue. If serving for 34 years doesn't give me an insight into what the police department is doing, I don't think a Citizens Academy is going to help me. But that showed me the level of misunderstanding and lack of information that was necessary. So although this has been a very methodical process, I feel comfortable that we're at that point where we've covered, I think, every concern that was brought forward. I'm sure that, let's just throw a crazy number, maybe there were 15 concerns. We've covered them. When we come up with a recommendation, somebody will say, yeah, but what about this one? Yeah, but what about this one? That's always going to happen. You're never going to have a, an end to it. So for me, that's where I think the department's doing a good job of anticipating what's next and not waiting for it to be re uh, reactive and it are actually um, proactive in looking at what is going to happen next. So I, I feel real comfortable that uh, although it's been a long process, I think that to have cut it too short would have given more fodder to the argument that we didn't cover everything. Um, so I, I, I am glad, Chief, that you and your staff have been patient with us and have uh, listened to us. And uh, I don't know that we've ever got to a point, at least my, myself, that when we asked a question, we didn't get a sufficient answer because you, even if it would fell short of, mm -hmm. uh, of everything we wanted to hear, you were open to the questions and, and received them as professionals and, and uh, not defensively, but saying, oh yeah, maybe I didn't tell you about this because we have so much going on. So I think the length and the and, uh, detail of our committee's work has been um, pretty exhaustive. And I want to thank my committee members, uh, uh, Councilwoman Hiller and Councilwoman Ortiz for having taken this up because you know a lot of people wanted to talk about this. Some people passed on the opportunity to serve on this community. That's right. On this committee. If it was that important, they should have picked up on that opportunity to serve on this committee. Because it's not going to be an easy job, and it hasn't been, but it's a very, been a very informative one. So again, I appreciate the opportunity to have had a part in this. And Chair, uh, I think you've done a good job. And, running these meetings and keeping us on time. we got 30 minutes. So <laughs> uh, I just bring that up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so let me, let's go to number five, discussions regarding public input sessions. I, I think I am satisfied with bringing everything that I have to the table. Um, unless, Mike, you or Karen have anything else that you would like another meeting or another agenda uh, to put on the agenda. I, I need to know that now. If there's something, um, we, we, I need to know that because I have gone through the notes and like the chief, I'm like, dang, you know. Um, um, but I, it was very, it was very crucial that I went through and listened to everybody. I'm only halfway through that spoke and we've already gotten through the list of everything that they were asking when we heard four and a half hours of testimony from the public. Um, but we need to come up with our recommendations and get them. And I think you guys had um, wanted to come up with the recommendations, present them to the public, and then have another public input session. Is that correct? That's what I took away yeah. from the last meeting. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to come up with our recommendations and present them. Our recommendations have to we, we, have to, we have to come up with recommendations to take back to the council. And at that particular time, we'll hear testimony. And what I wanted to do was come up with recommendations and 
put publicize them and then have them come back to the council because they're going to have to come back to the council to approve the recommendations of the body mm -hmm. of the committee so um, however you guys see fit we can set a April meeting um, I'm not done with all of my recommendations but I'm wrapping them up um, I don't know how much more time you guys need where you guys are at so I guess I'm looking for input from you guys um, so that I can consolidate all the recommendations so chair if I understand uh, we're at that point where our recommendations would be brought to, to me you. to me to the chair to consolidate uh, those we're, would be compiled yes yes uh, I would imagine they go back up to the both of us so that we make sure we have been clear in what our yes. piece of, it, of those recommendations yes. are. Yes, what I'm ready for you guys to do is I'm ready for recommendations to come to the chair, your recommendations, so that we can compile all the recommendations, um, and then we can make sure um, to get a final um, before we present them to the public. And then, and then we would take them to the governing body? Well, you guys said you wanted to hear from public input <coughs> after we presented the... Um, the recommendations. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. After we we did that, mm -hmm. that public input input mm -hmm. session, and then with the full expectation that I don't want to say that's the end of it, but then it goes to the governing body for their review and discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At that particular time, if you want to, if you want, let's say I recommend that they they don't have blue uniforms anymore. We'll put them in green, and the public comes back and says, no, we need to keep them in blue. So then, you know, we can either make changes at the that that particular time before it goes back to to the uh, council, or we can vote vote to keep it however we want to do it. But we we've got to come up with those recommendations. Yeah, I'm I'm comfortable with moving forward, and and, and so a timeline. Are you looking at then uh, the April to have our recommendations compiled mm -hmm. and enough so that we can present them mm -hmm. on a date in April? Mm -hmm. And then, do you guys want to do April or May? Because we've got a, we've got a lot of meetings in, we've got a lot in of April. Going on right now. We sure do. All right. I guess what I'm hearing is is a sequence of, and you had given us a deadline of April one. Of April one. If I need to hit it, I will. I could probably use an extra weekend um, because there are a lot of things going yeah. on right now. We're we're supposed to look at the CIP before <laughs> Monday as well. I kind I kind of did that only because. So we can get to moving on. No, I understand. So, so we, just in, in terms of sequence, as I'm hearing it, a deadline that's going to be either April 1 or maybe a little bit later, but then we would get them to you. It would seem that we need a meeting. It might not be a long one to, to talk as just the committee again about how those recommendations shape up into a list and, and us work it, then have a meeting after that. That's a, a public input session. Then just we, at the committee level on on you know the review of everything that we did and then the recommendations that we have out we can, of it we can have a we can have a I can set a deadline for the recommendations to compile them and then we can at our next April we can just discuss the recommendations is that what you want to do uh, well do you want to discuss them or, or, I mean, tell me what you want to do or do you want the whole month of the April? I mean, we've got a lot of stuff in April. We do. Yeah. And trust and believe, I've, I'm, I'm going through paperwork and some of my notes don't even make sense. I, I want to be fair. After all this work has been done, I don't want to rush the final recommendations mm -hmm. right. uh, and shoot a hole in what we've tried to get done. Uh, shoot a hole? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so it's missing, uh, but so I would feel more comfortable that our recommendations come to you probably by mid-April or, or toward the end of April because you're right. We have the CIP. We're soon we're going to start on budget, and and uh, we want to give our full attention to the final product here, um, but maybe with the goal of having that, uh, of maybe even not having a a meeting in, in this fashion in April, but come together in May with all of that completed, uh, sent to you and compiled by you, and presented in May. 
Okay, so what I'm going to do is let's see, we got I'm going to say by April April the 22nd, I want everybody's recommendations to me or to Liz. Okay. April 22nd, that's due. Then I'll set up a May meeting. I'll go in with Liz and set up a May meeting. Actually, because you know what? You, we've got that trip at the end of April, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're not even going to be here. Yeah. I mean, not not when we usually meet. Mm -hmm. And I'm so, busy enough, I haven't even said I would go. <laughs> so. Okay, so. Yep. We're saving you a seat. All right. So we have, there's, there's just no way, I just don't. I could do it. I'd have to work around the clock, but I, 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 I'm just saying, what did I just say, Liz, the 22nd? 22nd. 22nd? Okay. Um, 22nd, have them um, do, and we'll put that on their that. calendar. And I want a week in advance, okay? Include the chief on that in, in case he has something that he has questions on or that he, he can be reminded of that. Um, I will get with you guys in May because May we have Mother's Day, we have graduation. That doesn't really affect us, but I'm just saying in case people go out of town. So I will have Liz look at May. Is anybody and so look at your May calendar to see if you're going out of town or if you're doing anything. Are you looking at Friday afternoons again? Um, yeah, I would like to. Does I'm that okay. work better for you? No, it doesn't. It, it's, I'm hoping it's, to get out of town sometime, but right now I'm good. Mayor, you want Thursday or you want Friday? Oh, might as well go ahead and stick with Thursday. If, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's do the, you want to do the 19th or the 26th? Well. Of May. When's Memorial, when's Memorial weekend? Memorial Day is the 30th. The 30th? Well, what? the 26th, that's, there's some NIAs there. Um. Let's see what else. Maybe Friday would be better after all. The 27th? Yeah. That's one more a weekend. Mm. Or if you want to back oh, it up right. to the 20th. Yeah, let's go with the, maybe the 20th. The let's 20th is a Friday. You want to do the 19th? 19th. Do the 19th, Liz. That's, that's straight over a meeting that I, a standing meeting that I have on a Thursday. A third Thursday is a conflict for me. Okay. Is that the same one we had today? This is a fourth Thursday, and we've got the back-to-back -back MPO, but, you know, photo finish. <laughs> if we go a fourth Thursday, about a third Thursday, I have a 3.30 meeting. Can we do the 20th, Mike? That's a Friday. I mean, do you have anything going on? Other than I know you on a week. i got a couple of tentative, but I think I could make the changes. Mm -hmm. um, the only other thing we'd have to do is... If we did a Wednesday, I don't really like to do Wednesdays. I don't want to do it any earlier. Let's let's set it for the twentieth, and we'll go from there. For I, right I now. can do the eighteenth if, if you want to do a Wednesday. That one's okay. I really don't like to do Wednesdays. All right, because I have so much to do after after the council meetings. Okay. Okay. We'll tentatively set it for that. Okay. Same time, three o'clock. Okay. Again, um, Liz has provided me um, a link, and I will send it to you guys. Um, it's of it's of all of our meetings. Is that correct, Liz? Does that include the four hours of testimony, four and a half hours? I have to look. If it's not on there, then that one I can add it to. Okay. Yeah. So it's a it's a great link. You just pop it, and you can go to anyone if you have any questions um about what was said or, or anything that you want to review and trust me once you start digging into it you will um and anything else that you need liz is there there to provide it okay so yes. your thought if we meet the 20th is that in in maybe tentative look would be that we would set a public input session with this committee in june and then if it went, if we didn't change anything or it was really simple and we did it at the end of that meeting, we, we, we go to council with it in July. If we need another meeting after that public input session to process the feedback and maybe amend our, our recommendations a little bit, we would have a committee meeting 
in July or really late June, something what, like that. What I am hearing from you and Mike is mm -hmm. we're, we're going to present, take April to get our recommendations together. Mm -hmm. Okay, to finish those. Mm -hmm. And then in May, we're going to meet back here mm -hmm. so me, you, and him can, so the committee can discuss the recommendations. Right. Chief, I still want you there at that meeting. Yes, ma'am. Just in case some questions come up. Yes, ma'am. Um, so we're going to use May to discuss. And not plan anything. For and sure. not plan anything. And then June, we will have public input. By then, after we discuss our recommendations, then we can pub then and we're all good with them, then we can publicize them and have June input. That's what I said to you. So that's what I thought okay. you had in mind. If, if somehow we can't come to but that, another but that's meeting, not going we'll back. That. That's not going back to the committee in June, though. I thought that's what you just said. Well, we as we as the committee would have that public input session in June, mm -hmm. and we would do that, be, and then make sure we would either affirm or change the right. recommendation list we have and take them to the council after right. we've had some public input. And right. So that might happen in sequence in pretty short order it might take us some time right is that what i'm hearing okay right good are you good with that sounds good okay there's nothing else to come before the council or before this committee this meeting is adjourned thank you you're ahead of time